Welcome to a very special session of education at the crossroads. I am Christian Alting von Geusau, joined today by my good friend and colleague Bernard Dorna. We have chosen for this episode on beauty, truth and heroism in education a little mountain close to Trumau called the Große Otter, one of the many hidden beauties in the Austrian Alps. And Bernhard, I chose for a good reason this location where we have just hiked up with some of our colleagues and are enjoying the absolutely stunning views that are all around us. And today I would like to speak in this session about the importance of beauty to start with, the importance of beauty in education. Throughout the many years that I have been privileged to work in education, to serve in education and to lead educational institutions, there's one big lesson that I have learned. And that is that everything falls or stands with the atmosphere we create, with the culture that the educational institution has and radiates. And one of the things that I've discovered there over the years is that it is of utmost importance that we carefully look out for what sort of building do we have? What sort of architecture do we have? How are the furnishings? But another very important one, and this is one of the reasons why we are here in this spectacular landscape, is that the natural surroundings are so important. Because if there's one thing during this past year and a half that the whole world has been suffering from this corona crisis, if there's one thing I have really come to discover even more than before, is the importance of us human beings again finding ourselves in nature, in God's creation. It uplifts our souls. It allows us to understand the language of being. And it allows us to be open to the truth. And so today I would like to discuss with you the importance of beauty and education. And you being a man that grew up, I would say, in the cultural beauty of Vienna, but also in the mountainous region of Salzburg, you have hiked your whole life in the mountains. You do so every summer, like I do. And then you have taught throughout your life. You have taught philosophy and theology. And our years now, many years together at the ITI, you have always been very much, I would say, preoccupied with this theme. How do we bring beauty into education? What are your thoughts on beauty and education? Yeah. Yeah. Without beauty, there is no attraction. <clears throat> Without beauty, there is no openness of the heart. Without beauty, there is no possibility to teach. This is my, uh, my, my experience. Because beauty is a kind of radiance, a kind of charm, which is not only in nature, of course in nature it is, look around here. It is also in books, it is also in human beings. And it has to do with the soul of a, of a person. If the person is at home in himself, then the beauty of the soul radiates. And this is a way that a person or a pupil or student can be attracted. attracted. Beauty has a lot to do with an inner harmony, mm -hmm. with harmony. If we look here in the nature and see the blue sky, the green meadow, the trees, this is, this is a kind of symphony here. Mm -hmm. And a kind of a music is here. And the Bible expresses it so beautifully. It says, the trees are singing. How can trees sing? They have a kind of song which is without words. Without words. This language needs to be rediscovered in order to get an understanding what beauty is. And the greatest beauty is the face of man. Mm -hmm. The face of man. 
because no face of no faces there are similarities in faces but if you look at the face you see something which is exceptional mm -hmm. and beauty has to do with that what is precious exceptional reading the soul yes yes mm -hmm. exactly reading the soul it 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 gives something which is the the tradition said ineffabile ineffable this ineffable is so necessary for human beings to rediscover and beauty is the first step to it 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 gives us an attachment to great great things and here for example we were sitting on the bench we could not talk yes that was i i was again reminded of that as we were all sitting there on the summit yes we couldn't talk we could not talk we were unable to talk yeah. And yes. that's until we discovered that we did not need to talk. No, we don't need to talk. Because everything around us was yeah. speaking to us. Exactly. Everyone speaks to us and wants to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And we human beings are created to give an answer to all that realities which speaks to us. And beauty is the way how God created the world. And in a way it is a, an illusion to something which we cannot see but we get a sense for it of grandeur, of greatness, of a hidden greatness. And I think these are the elements which are so important today for education. And you, you Bernard, you, you, you allude to something very important there that we just experienced there on that summit. And that is we couldn't talk. Yes. And we suddenly discovered that we didn't need to talk. No because our surroundings were speaking to us, God's creation was speaking to us. Yes. And that brings me to, would you also see that, that one of the vital elements of beauty is silence? Because that's of course what, when I go hiking, I always love that and the same walking in the woods. I love this silence. Yes. There is mm -hmm. no noise, we just hear the wind and we hear the birds. And that silence, and that's again what we just experienced there on that summit, that silence actually makes us silent and allows us to hear, allows us to listen. And beauty and silence, do they necessarily go together? Absolutely. I think by necessity, mm -hmm. by necessity, walking up this hill, this mountain, I thought about beauty and I listened to birds, to a dialogue of birds here. This was very, very beautiful and I was reminded in Salzburg we have a big garden and we are, my wife and myself we are very often sitting in the evening listening to the birds, in spring especially. Today also we walked up and I was listening to a dialogue of birds and it came into my mind what Josef Haydn did. Joseph Haydn composed the creation and, of, and my mother-in-law is a musician and we listened to that part of music once and she told me, do you hear the, do you hear the birds, the birds which he composed? He was listening in nature to that and he put it into, into notes and put it and gave us this great work, this wonderful work. Here you see what beauty and what listening to beauty affects what, what it can produce, mm -hmm. what, it can, what it can give to the world. Therefore, this is the, the attitude where you become creative. Exactly. Uh, and you begin to, to do something in your life which you wouldn't do without such a silence and such an attentiveness to reality. Uh, so that you find also your sources, your, your, your vocation. Yeah. So beauty in education actually, and beauty in life yeah. in general, actually leads us to the art of listening. Yes. As you say, as listening to reality. Mm -hmm. And that again allows us to really listen, to understand the language of being. And that's, that's that's yeah. where, where the silence comes in. And this always makes me think, again, I think we can only speak about beauty and silence 
when we speak from our own experience. And the experience that I have really gone through through so many years, I always like to tell there are two places where I feel closest to God. The first place is in front of the Blessed Sacrament in the Eucharist. And the second place is high up in the mountain on mm -hmm. the pasture. Why is that? Because there all the noise of which we have so much in our world and that causes so much anxiety and all the ugliness that we have in our world that also causes so much anxiety and thus distracts. All that is gone and we suddenly have this silence as God created mm -hmm. the world. And then suddenly, I don't know if you have had that experience, but I always have that experience, I suddenly start understanding things that down there in the valley I didn't understand. I start seeing things that before I did not see because that distraction is gone. Hmm. Yes, I, I understand very much what you have expressed here. It is a kind of recollection. Which, it's a recollection. A recollection which happens in, in beauty, on, especially on the mountains. I have an experience in the mountains. This was in Salzburg once on a, on also on the top of a mountain. And it was evening, it was a sunset, a sunset, very, very beautiful. Great, great silence around. Deep, deep silence, snow below. And, and the sun was setting and suddenly it came into my mind, and this is very astonishing. The beauty spoke to me in such a way, you need to change your life. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. This was a you need because it is so great that I cannot really comprehend it. Mm -hmm. And I need to do more to, to, to comprehend what already comprehends me, but I cannot comprehend it. Right. There's a something in between. Right. And this is our attitude, our life, our behavior. And so it is a kind of purification, what, right. ha what happens. That's a beautiful word. That's a beautiful word, purification. Yeah. That's what it does to yeah. us. Beauty purifies us. Yeah. And the silence that accompanies it yeah. is something that purifies us and thus opens our eyes and ears and especially our heart to hear and to listen and finally to come to where we need to be. We're now going to continue our little walk up the summit. So Bennett, as we just came climbing up this little summit of the Golso Otter again, we walked towards the cross that in Austria we always find on each mountain summit. And we have come now to this beautiful point on this summit where we look at two great summits of this area of Austria, the Schneeberg and the Rax, both two beautiful mountains. And I thought it actually very symbolic that we walk up to the cross and we walk up to the summit to speak about the next theme today, and that is truth. And I want to tell you a little story and hope you can develop our conversation further on that. In this whole past one and a half year, 
that we have lived in this global crisis and that we have all been often locked in. There is one thing that I very much appreciated, at least in this country, and that's because Austrians are lovers of nature, is that one thing we were not locked away from, and that is walking. So I spent, as I already said earlier, a lot of time also with the children to go walking, to go into the mountains. But there's another thing that I've been spending a lot of time doing, and that is biking. Biking from my home to the campus of the ITI in Trumau. And one of the images that will remain with me always is that starting in April 2020, when I started doing that, in fact, every day, biking from my home to the campus, which is about an hour bikes ride, there was always a point, there is always a point, where I pass an open field and in the distance I see this mountain. I see the Schneeberg. And of course, way in, up until May, you will see snow on it. And the thought that kept returning to me is that, and I saw it again this year in 2021, as I bike through that field, there's a thought that always returns to me. And that is this mountain, this summit of creation has been standing there countless of millions of years. And it has seen plagues, it has seen wars, it has seen unrest and famine and whatever we human beings all do. But that mountain remained, that visible sign of God's creation remained. And that told me something about truth, because no matter how much we as humanity may suffer through ages, through plagues, through wars, the truth of what it means to be human, the truth of creation remains unchanged. The seasons have continued even in this pandemic. The birds have continued waking up in spring. The mountain has been there and remains there. And this has been a very powerful image for me always and a great sign of hope because no matter what we human beings do and all the things, all the trouble we get ourselves into, we always see that there is this stability in creation. And that is the created order. That created order remains. We try to often, as human beings, destroy it or adapt it to our wishes. But we're not very successful at that. As we know from history, it usually goes wrong when we try to do that. And I find that image very powerful when it comes to truth, also truth in education. Because in our modernity, we seem to have forgotten that conversation a little bit. It's all about opinions and feelings and the latest social media hypes. But it's very little about together seeking the truth. How do you think in education we can again come back to learning as human beings to take upon ourselves the humble task of discovering the truth of what it means to be human and do that step by step without thinking that we can actually ourselves play God. To, to understand or to come in attachment with the truth especially for young people, uh, I think there must be done a lot today. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what you said with, the, with, the, with this influence of opinions, mm -hmm. with the mass media, I think this is all disturbing mm -hmm. to that what we mean, what the truth is. What it's the, all this noise again yes, which you were speaking about yes, earlier. the confusing noise the destructive noise, <clears throat> which is with, at the end, meaningless. Uh, what we need to do is to have, first of all, if you speak about students and about education, professors or teachers who are really striving for the truth. Mm -hmm. 
and we do that in different ways. For example, what you told in nature, to rediscover the natural law, the, the order of creation. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very important step towards the truth. This, the same is, of course, in, a, in that what we do in classes. We need to, to bring in contact the students with the great sources of the tradition. And isn't it also important, we spoke about this in an earlier yeah. episode, isn't it also so important that we as the teachers live truthfulness? This is that that truthfulness yeah. is in ourselves. As without that, if there's not a striving for the truth and the truth is not living in the teacher, it is not present in him or he is not really directed to it, it is a problem. I think the, the best teachers are the teachers who convey the truth through their existence. Yes, and through their striving, because yes. you and I are both fathers yes. and, and, and teachers. And I think one of the things I have learned also the hard way as a father also is that if my word isn't unified with my actions. Yes. If mm -hmm. how I live doesn't correspond to what I say, or at least my effort yeah. to live in truthfulness, if that doesn't correspond to what I say, it's the most destructive thing we can do in education. Yeah. If the words which we speak are far away from that what we think, if that is not connected, the word and the thought, if we don't strive for that, that, that what we express is really our thought. And this is a hard, hard striving. A very hard we, striving. We, we know that also how difficult it is to bring a good thought on paper right. to, to express the truth mm -hmm. of the reality. Mm -hmm. So this needs to be learned in education, that mm -hmm. a student or a pupil needs to work hard, but he can do that only if he is attracted by it, mm -hmm. because he sees it by other persons who do that. Mm -hmm. They are attracted because this person is not only hard working, but he is in an, a kind of enthusiasm for it, a, a kind of inner involvement, this, so that there is a joy in that work, mm -hmm. and not only a striving which is a kind of a burden. Right. So to search for the truth is the most beautiful reality, the most beautiful work which we can do in life. And how can we convince the world around us that that is so? Because of course we know that the world around us, you know, especially the secular world, doesn't accept the concept of truth. It does away with that. It, it points to opinions and it points to feelings as, as yeah. so to say, that which should rule our lives. And of course, the whole concept of truth is considered to be something terribly outdated and something that we cannot really work with. So you're speaking about this enthusiasm. We spoke about that also yeah. in a previous yes. episode. But how can we, in education, in the people that are in our care, really make them understand that this humble, and I really want to say humble search for truth because we can so easily get self-righteous, you know, and thinking that we own the truth, which I think is the biggest mistake because no, none of us owns the truth. We can only try to walk towards it in this striving. But how, how do we convince the people in our care and educational institutions that this long, difficult road, however, as you say, something that gives deep joy, how can we convince them that it is worth going down this road because it's so countercultural? Yes, but we need to do it. There's no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to suffer it. We need also to suffer that many people don't go with us, but we cannot not do it. We mm -hmm. need to do it, and this will convince others, and this is our hope. And I will give you also a kind of story which I heard from a rabbi. A rabbi. Mm -hmm. He told a story about, about teaching, and there came a student to him, and he was very, very educated and learned and he came to him and has studied so much and he said to him, to this very famous rabbi, he said to him, Rabbi, I have studied so much, I know so much, I have so much knowledge, but you see, it is empty. Mm -hmm. I know so much, but it's empty. I'm curious for everything, but it's empty. Mm -hmm. And the, the rabbi looks at him 
and says to him, yes, you are a tall young man. Mm -hmm. And he looked at the book which he had in front of him and showed the book and said, look, these little letters, mm -hmm. and you are so big. Mm -hmm. You have to come into the words, into the reality. Mm -hmm. Then it will give the taste. Mm -hmm. So this we need to teach young mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. also students, that they need to be educated in becoming very humble, step by step, entering mm -hmm. and guided in that. Mm -hmm. But the world does not go with us. I think this is a reality, but this makes me not any more very, very anxious. Mm -hmm. It is more important if some people do that, mm -hmm. a new world will be created. We see that if people do that, this, a new world is created, maybe a little group. Mm -hmm. And we know that from history, not the, a big mass of people changed the world. These are the saints. Right. One person might sometimes One person at a time. change the, uh, right. the, the, the way of history. Right. So we need to focus on that in education. Yes, and that reminds me of a, a, a great uh, podcast I recently heard where Jordan Peterson yeah. is in conversation with Bishop Barron. And Jordan Peterson says right at the beginning of the podcast, and that really got me to think, he said, you know what the reason is why so many young people turn their backs to the church and to faith, he said, it's because the church doesn't demand enough from them. Yes. They are not attracted to soft stories or to half-truths. Yeah. They are only attracted to a challenge, something they have to fight for, something they have to work for. And I was really struck by that because this comes from a man who himself is not a Catholic, and who is, who is, however, a great intellectual and a great student of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Yes. And this is what he said. He literally said to Bishop Barron, he said, you, the Catholic Church, you have to start demanding more from young people. Then they will come flocking to the church because they want this clarity. And, and, and that's, in a way, what you're saying. We have to be willing to suffer in this lifelong journey towards the truth. And it, it comes always into my mind that you can only live the truth if you are ready to die for. Right. And uh, we all are searching for such a reality. We want to give our life. Right. But we need to give it for a meaningful reality. Exactly. And, and so if we search for the truth, Really, we want to give our life for the truth. Exactly. Yeah. And this cannot be done that we, we, we make compromises here. Right. This cannot be done that we understand everything and we don't ask. Exactly. We don't ask. Yes, we have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We are asked. We are asked with our existence. We are asked. Something is asked for man. Right. We on, not only have rights, right. we have responsibilities duties. and we duties, have duties. Yeah. exactly yeah. and and this has this is very very much necessary because young people are searching for that that they can give their life for something very precious right and if you don't can give it for something very precious it comes the moment then they go to drugs or whatever right they go away yeah if you don't and give meaningless. them if you don't give them yeah. a real cause yes a real cause yes. to fight for with their yeah. life, to give themselves, then they will flock yeah. away and to try to find other things which fulfill this most yes. inner desire. And that is, of course, what we have to do in education. Uh, we have to awaken what lies hidden as a seat yeah. in the hearts and the minds of young people. Yeah. So we have found a rock here, a rock on the summit of the Große Otter. And I would like to continue our conversation, Bernard, on a third theme that I think has everything to do 
with the beauty and truth in education and the need for that and the need for teaching the people in our care what beauty is and how we can search the truth. And a logical theme, a third theme today to conclude this episode is heroism. Because again, especially referring to the times in which we live today, where any idea or any suggestion even of there being a truth is utterly rejected. And where we also see something that concerns me very much and worries me very much, where censorship, especially in the Western world, is rising in a way that we haven't seen it. The last time we've probably seen that was under communists and Nazi regimes in the 20th century. And of course, in a regime like the Chinese Communist Party in China or in North Korea, there we see that sort of censorship. But we're seeing that censorship on the rise massively in the West. And it seems that there is a great contradiction because if on the one hand our society utterly rejects the concept of truth, why is it then so afraid that people try to express what they think should be said and what they think is an important contribution to coming towards the truth. So I see that there's a great contradiction in that. On the one hand, we reject the concept of truth, but on the other hand, we do everything to censor information or opinions or thoughts that do not correspond to the current narrative, to the current orthodoxy. And my thinking is therefore that in education today, we really need to educate people to become heroes, but not heroes in the, in the Hollywood sense. Heroism, I like the word heroism much more than heroes. Heroes is already, already a little bit of a tainted word. But heroism is a beautiful word. We know it also from the old Greek mythology. And of course, we also know that the great saints were living heroism. Why? Because they were never afraid to speak the truth according to a well-formed conscience. Of course, my favorite saint is St. Thomas More, who died because he was not willing to compromise his conscience. So if we speak about the need for formation in heroism in education, what would you understand under heroism? I understand, of course, heroism is a very rare reality yes. in education. Why? Because we have not this perspective anymore. I think old teaching was always directed to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I mentioned before, this, uh, uh, an education was always intended that you get so much knowledge and erudition or wisdom uh, that you are able to give your life for something greater than your own self. This is the, a deep, deep knowledge out of our tradition. Uh, this is forgotten now, that we have not educated students this perspective. In the virtues. Yes, in That's the virtues. That's why we have the virtues. Yeah. The virtues are forgotten mm -hmm. and something comes to it. I think we are so much orientated to the fulfillment of our needs. And our and desires. And our desires. And at the same time, we are so anxious, mm -hmm. full of fear. Mm -hmm. I, I'm reminded on a word in the gospel, not in the gospel, I think it is in the Hebrews letters, mm -hmm. where they said, Christ came to deliver us from the lifelong bondage of fear of death. Mm -hmm. And what I see in our times, exactly that. Yeah, we see under now. Under the bondage of fear of death. We all live under the bondage yeah. of fear of death, especially today yeah. in 2021. And the remedy for that 
-hmm. The remedy is the truth. Mm -hmm. To stick to the truth and our understanding of education has to focus on that very much. To strengthen young people to come in contact with the sources of the truth. And because then they are strong enough, mm -hmm. they get a kind of energy, an energy we need for that, that we say no where no is necessary mm -hmm. and a yes where a yes is necessary with all the consequences. So uh, I think heroism, you can also say fortitude or courage. courage. This is an attitude in the old tradition where you give your life to protect or to, make, to, to, to play in the way for the truth, that it is not hidden, mm -hmm. and for the reality of the truth. So it is a protection of that. Mm -hmm. For that, of course, you need to have an insight into the truth. Mm -hmm. You can only give your life if you have a greater perspective. And isn't that exactly what the search for truth means, is that I am continuously willing to seek and to expand my perspective, to, to yeah. go beyond, beyond what I think is, you know, what I think should be said or what I think would be heard, and it's to go further and to go deeper and to read more and to contemplate more and to discuss more and to read more what the great texts of our civilization have as answers to the problems of today. So really, this heroic seeking for the truth that is so countercultural actually requires, and this is so often misunderstood, that we are willing to broaden our perspective. I think this is one of the biggest misunderstandings in this search for truth that we are dealing with in today's society. People think that it means that you're then limiting yourself to some sort of dogmatic, no, no. you know, dogmatic corset where you cannot go out. But it's exactly the opposite. You know, it's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the search for truth means that I go further and further and that I go deeper and that I go beyond. Yes. Which you also see it like that. Yes, this, this search for freedom in the wrong direction is today very present. That means not to have no rules, no, no, no laws anymore, mm -hmm. which you follow because you think they are yeah, restrictive, mm -hmm. very restrictive. But in a way we need it. Mm -hmm. We need laws, we need the truth in, also presented in laws. So the teaching of the church gives us. Mm -hmm. For us it is the teaching of the church, which mm -hmm. is very important here. Mm -hmm. And to follow that, and even if I don't completely understand it, mm -hmm. you have to follow it in order to understand more, what you mm -hmm. not understand before. Mm -hmm. So it is not a reduction, it is not a limitation. The law, the tradition knows more than you ever can know. Mm -hmm. And in the documents or in the laws, something is preserved which is greater than you ever have thought that it can be. Mm -hmm. This is like a piece of music. If you play it, suddenly the music comes out and you see how great that is. Mm -hmm. And if you do that with the laws which you follow, mm -hmm. which are given by God to us, the same is, is the case. Mm -hmm. You have to do more than you understand in order to understand better. Mm -hmm. This is a reality. But that's, that in fact says, and again, this is one of the mis big misunderstandings yeah. when we speak about truth. Truth always corresponds with reality. Completely. And this is something that is, is, of course, often forgotten. Truth is not some sort of vague concept that is out there that we forget. Truth is corresponding to reality, which means if we in education want people to start or to embark on the road towards understanding ever better the truth of what it means to be human, we are really telling them embark on the road of understanding ever more the reality in which we live and accept the reality of the created order. And that is, for example, very important in these days, the reality that we have been created as man and as woman. Yeah, and that nature has seen it fit that it be like that. So that we, in this seeking truth, actually are only trying to understand better the reality 
of what it means to be human in the order that is there. And connected with that is a peace. Exactly. An inner peace. Mm -hmm. And you are by yourself. Mm -hmm. This is the fruit of such an activity. You are at home in yourself mm -hmm. because you are in reality. Mm -hmm. You are in being. Mm -hmm. You are what you are. Mm -hmm. You are not estranged from yourself. Mm -hmm. So this is the way to find back to our own source. It's not only to the sources of the tradition, but to the source of our own existence. We need mm -hmm. to do that. At the beginning is a great commitment. Sometimes you don't understand it, but it has to be followed that you get what you didn't expect from it. And there we come to what you said earlier, that in this endeavor, we have to be willing to suffer Yes. We have to be willing to carry challenges, difficulties. And that is where this call to heroism comes in, because we actually have to be willing to make sacrifices for that. We have to make sacrifices for the greater good, right. what we have seen. And there's another heroism, of course, and this is the Christian heroism. This is connected with, with hope. Mm -hmm. This is hope. Hope is a grace. It is a, a, a theological virtue. We can pray for that. Mm -hmm. We can pray th for, the, for, the, for the grazia of hope in order to be a hero. Mm -hmm. We can pray for that. And what means to have hope? To have a hope also not that, we, that there is a life after life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, is, this life is not everything. Mm -hmm. So this perspective is very, very necessary to be to be a hero. And wasn't that exactly the perspective of the great saints? Yes. Wasn't they lived not for this world. They lived in this world, but not out of the sources of this world. Right. They lived from above. Mm -hmm. And they lived in this world from above. And this is, this is, we have the sources which are so great. And this gives us a courage to give your life is first of all, a grace, a gift from God. But we can prepare it. We, can be, we, we, we have to become dignified for that. We need to prepare it with our, with our striving, with mm -hmm. our searching for the truth. And maybe we receive the gift that we get this courage. The great saints sometimes were very, very anxious before they, 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 they were killed. Mm -hmm. But they prayed. They said, yes, fear is not taken away. Mm -hmm. Fear is not taken away, but it is this beyond, this beyond, this, this hope, this perspective, which is an insight, which is a grace. Yeah, yeah. Those, great hero those, those, those great saints yeah. that lived in such heroism, they used the light of Christ yes. and that is beyond our merely human existence to light the reality in which they found themselves on earth and to be able to come to know that reality ever better, understand it, and so to say, follow their calling within that reality without trying to forcefully adapt that to their wishes. And that they could do because they were seeing, as you say, beyond. Beyond and they were humble. Right. Very, very humble. Right. But they couldn't do another step because they were attached to the truth. And, and connected with that is really that you can get a hope, a grace of a hope which goes beyond. And for that you give your life. And the moment when you give your life, this is also a moment which is a grace. Right. Because it is a fulfillment. And I think we this is also a perspective that we as human beings are in a start to via Tori. We are on we are on a pilgrimage mm -hmm. here. We are on a pilgrimage. Yeah. We are on a pilgrimage. And this we need to see again. And mm -hmm. we, this needs to be taught the students. This needs to be taught uh, young people, especially if they are uh, in, in the Catholic Church. They need to be, I would say, prepared for very difficult times. Right. And they need to have. Yes, and they need to get, need to be encouraged to. Right. And they to, need yeah. to be formed into the heroism that yeah. allows yes. them to stand straight. To the truth and the love right. which and is to connected. Yeah. Yes, and that brings us in conclusion, full circle back to beauty. As I am looking straight ahead of me, I'm looking at the summit of the Schneeberg that is beautifully covered in snow. 
we come full back because what does beauty do to us and why is it so important to have it center stage in education which is also the reason why we decided to film this episode here is because beauty allows us to see beyond our merely own earthly existence yeah. and that is actually what what you are saying and that's what the great heroes here we can use the word heroes of the christian tradition the great saints of course have taught us a glimpse a glimpse from, from, from something transcendent exactly so let's continue our road yes from the rock down to the hill <laughs>